Hi, everyone. This is Liz Harvey Roberts, Chief Development Officer for the Nature Conservancy in California. Thanks so much for joining us today. We know you have many webinar choices, and we're super glad that you're here with us. I know that many of you have really missed visiting our preserves. I do, too. It's such an awful time right now, and with the pandemic, many of us are really uh, very much at home these days. But we'd love to bring you to our preserves virtually. So with this third series in our Determining Decade webinar series, we're going to start focusing on our special preserves, taking you there virtually. Isn't that great? So the first stop is going to be the Jack and Laura Dangerman Preserve. As a matter of fact, I'm virtually standing there right now. And our tour guide is going to be Bill Leahy, the preserve manager. So please come and travel with me as we visit with Bill at the preserve. Hi, Liz. Thank you. Unlike you, who are in front of a virtual backdrop, I'm actually at the real deal. Welcome to the Jack and Laura Dangerman Preserve. There are few wild places left on the coast of California like this. The Jack and Laura Dangerman Preserve captures 24,000 acres at Point Conception, where I'm standing. Miles of undeveloped coastline, remote beaches, vast expanses of oak woodlands and grasslands. free-flowing streams, from mountain lions to elephant seal, from snowy plover to red-legged frog. This place is a treasure. In addition, it sits at a rare convergence where north meet south, both in the ocean and on land, offering us a rare opportunity to study and learn and share conservation success stories globally. This is an unprecedented opportunity for global research and discovery. You're going to hear more about that from Mark Reynolds. But first, why don't we go to the Halachichi Summit? From this vantage point, we're looking from the headwaters of the Halama Creek down the Halachichi Basin. This valley and the lands beyond were home for the Chumash Indians for millennia. Fast forward, and in the last couple of centuries, this land served as a working cattle ranch, which preserved it and kept it from development. For those reasons, the Nature Conservancy identified this place as one of its top priorities for conservation. And in 2017, thanks to the generosity of Jack and Laura Dangerman and the donors that they inspired, the Conservancy was able to acquire this land to establish a nature preserve. So over the last two and a half years, the Nature Conservancy has been working with our partners, including universities, public agencies, local nonprofits, neighbors, and the Chumash community on strategies for managing this unique property. First and foremost, we envision one of the most ambitious efforts ever undertaken to restore and protect this wild coast. Second, this preserve will serve as a living laboratory for scientific discovery around what it's going to take to preserve natural resources this time, guided by learnings from the Chumash, the original stewards of this place. Third, it will serve as an information hub, using the latest tools and technology to collect data and share that data globally to advance learning worldwide. Finally, this place will serve as a center for connection to inspire the next generation of conservation leader and to build public support for our conservation mission. The Jack and Laura Dangerman Preserve was established at a pivotal moment when the world is waking up to the vital need for environmental action. Countries worldwide are looking for ways to rebalance human interaction with the natural world and set the planet on a path to a more sustainable future. The preserve will serve as a platform for demonstrating how conservation can rise to this challenge. Just two and a half years into acquiring this preserve, our pursuit of this bold vision is already yielding major discovery. And now I'm going to turn this camera over to our lead scientist, Mark Reynolds, who will share some of those discoveries. 
Thanks, Bill. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, and thanks for joining our webinar. I hope everybody's staying safe during this difficult time. I'm Mark Reynolds, and I think I have the best job in conservation. I'm the lead scientist for the Dangerman Preserve. As you've seen in the videos, this place is breathtakingly beautiful, but I think the biodiversity and the opportunities for science are even more breathtaking. In fact, I can't think of another place that's more poised to use discovery to advance conservation. So let's take a closer look. The Dangerman Preserve is located near Point Conception, that part of the California coast that takes a right angle. So let's zoom in. The preserve is 20, nearly 25,000 acres, which is about the same size as the area of San Francisco. Protecting this place completes an important piece of the regional conservation puzzle. This is, uh, provides connectivity from the protected areas of the Los Padres National Forest to the south and to the east. Uh, along and um, through the Vandenberg Coast, 100,000 acres of coastline um, to the north. The preserve is located at an ecological crossroads at Point Conception, where ecoregions found in Northern California uh, join ecoregions found in Southern California, both on the marine and the terrestrial side. This creates a rich biodiversity stew, and many species are at the limits of their range here. For example, the tan bark oak, which is found in, um, from southern Oregon all the way down the coast to the Point Conception area on the land side. On the marine side, we might think of the California Corbina, which is a fish that is found from Baja, California, north to the Point Conception area. There aren't many places in the world like this, and this is increasingly important as we think about species having to move in response to climate change. So the, the protection and connectivity in Point Conception is an important um, stepping stone for species to get north as they're being pushed by climate change. It also provides us with a unique vantage point into a changing world. Let's take a closer look at the ecology and biodiversity. On the southern edge of the preserve, it joins the Point Conception State Marine Reserve, a 20 square mile California marine protected area. Together with the protection of the Dangerman Preserve, this makes one of the largest land, sea, protected area complexes in coastal Southern California. The preserve has eight miles of coastline, half of it facing the Pacific and half of it facing the Santa Barbara Channel. The preserve also has an entire Southern California coastal stream watershed, the Holama Creek, a very important stream for steelhead recovery. You see the mouth of Holama Creek emptying into the Pacific in the lower left part of the slide. There's an amazing diversity of natural communities at the preserve, a full 50 natural communities from coast live oak woodlands, chaparral and scrub, to streams, grasslands, and freshwater systems. Of these 50 different natural communities, a full half of them are categorized as sensitive. This is a biodiversity hotspot. There are 700 species that occur here, flora and fauna. Nearly 10% of them are threatened, endangered, or declining. It includes predators and prey, and many found nowhere else in the world. More amazing than that these species are, occur here is that they are found in a wild, intact ecosystem just a short distance from some of the most heavily urbanized places in North America and in the world. Urbanized coastlines along the south coast where beaches can be crowded. Now at the Dangerman Preserve, we also have beach crowding that occurs during spring and fall migration of our shorebirds. So the place is very wild. How wild is it? It's wild enough that mountain lions still hunt on the beaches and have been observed preying on seals hauled out to avoid white sharks. So what role might wildness play in modern conservation? I think there are two important roles. The first is the intrinsic value of wild places providing homes for species today and tomorrow. The bigger and wilder, the better and the more resilient. The second reason for wildness I think is learning. There's science that can only be done in places that are wild and intact. And this can provide guidance as we think about restoring nature in places that are less wild. So the Dangerman Preserve is really poised to build on its long history of protection as a private cattle ranch and now as a nature preserve to be a place of exploration and discovery. Now, when we think about discovery, we often think of the golden age of discovery of, of some of our heroes like Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall combined keen observational skills 
with simple tools like binoculars and field notebooks to lead to breakthroughs like documenting the first non-human tool use in chimpanzees. The Dangerman Preserve is coming online at a time when the technological revolution is really changing conservation. And we can apply really important technology like drones and conservation apps, LIDAR, sensors, and satellite imagery to addressing the conservation challenges that we have ahead. So the preserve is not only wild, but it's becoming more wired. So now I'm gonna to turn to the coastline and talk a little bit about discovery um, along the Dangerman Coast. Coastlines are, are the intermix of land and sea and they concentrate both biodiversity and stressors, making them ideal sites for studying environmental change. Now human pressure on the coast is intense. In fact, um, nearly 40% of the world's populations live within 60 miles of the coast. So we are working with the Nature Conservancy's oceans team and our conservation tech team and a number of partners on some exciting new science about climate change and coastal biodiversity. So let's take a closer look at some of the systems. Let's start with tide pools. Tide pools are formed along the rocky coast that's inundated with seawater. They're really extreme environments and they're homes for sea stars and anemones and mussels. These extreme environments really test the limits of these species. They have to be adapted to wave action and to drying out and to different conditions of salinity. Um, we're working with a team from University of California, Santa Cruz, led by Pete Ramundi. And Pete and his team are studying intertidal environments from British Columbia to, to Baja. And they have nearly 100 sites. But the point conception sites may be the most important because they occur along this important transition between Southern California systems and Northern California. The teams are working in the tide pools of the Dangerman Preserve and laying out transects and plots for long-term monitoring. You can see Walter Hetty, one of our scientists, working with an iPad here and collecting biodiversity data. One of the things that they're looking for in the tide pools are things like sea stars. Sea stars are indicators of tide pool health. They're keystone species. And you might've heard that they prey on urchins and on mussels. Not only are they keystone species, in fact, they're the species for which the keystone concept was invented. So when sea stars um, prey on urchins and on mussels, they keep their populations at bay and from overrunning systems. When sea stars decline, those populations of mussels and urchins can really explode. And in the case of urchins, the consequences can be disastrous, as, as we've seen in the decimation of kelp forests along the Northern California coast. This is an ochre sea star. They're found from British Columbia to the Point Conception area. They're at the edge of their range. And the research team has documented a steep decline in these and other sea stars along the Pacific coast and at the Dangerman Preserve. From uh, a mysterious disease called sea star wasting syndrome, and also from changing ocean conditions and warming ocean temperatures. Now the sea stars are starting to come back. There's some indication of that. And how they respond at a place at the limit of their range, like the Dangerman Preserve, is a really important uh, area for insights into how keystone species adapt to changing ocean conditions. Let's look a little more closely at our beach environment. Uh, sandy beaches, uh, rim a lot of the planet's shorelines, and they're caught in a vice between rising seas and coastal development. We are partnering with a team from UC Santa Cruz, led by Dr. Jennifer Dugan, on coastal biodiversity and monitoring of marine protected areas. We want to understand the linkages between terrestrial, coastal, and marine protection. You can see the team here operating a seine net at Perco's Beach. And this is really exciting work. It's just like going fishing. You never know what you're going to catch. And um, the team also deploys something called baited remote underwater video. So I'm going to show you a little video loop of what's right offshore here. You might not think in the surf zone there would be much life, but it turns out it's teeming with biodiversity. Here's a shot of some of the half a dozen species of surf perch that are found in the region, as well as an important nursery area for leopard sharks. I'm going to focus on a species called the barred surf perch, which uh, the team has been monitoring here at the Dangerman Preserve. Now these fish, when they're taken out of the nets, are measured and they're, they're let back into the ocean unharmed. The barred surf perch is a, a really important game species 
and it has a very interesting natural history. It gives birth to its young live, and it has very limited dispersal. At Perkos, along the marine protected area coast, there's a very strong signal of marine protection. And in fact, this is the best surf perch population in all of Southern California. It has the most recruitment of young and the most diversity of age structure and some of the largest uh, size classes. So this very strong signature of the value of marine protection coupled with coastal protection uh, gives us a, a lot of indication that that strategy is working and it helps bolster, bolster the Nature Conservancy's long-term interest in marine and coastal protection. So let's take a look at some of the discoveries that are being made up country. Um, California's flora is one of the most biodiverse in the world and California holds a lot of the evolutionary origins of plant tax of the world over. In fact, the Point Conception region has recently been identified in studies as one of the top evolutionary hotspots for plant biodiversity in California. But it's been very underserving. In fact, there are no collected material of plants from the Point Conception region in any museum or herbarium um, in the world. We sought to remedy that and reached out to Dr. Matt Ritter at, University of, uh, at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And Matt and his team of 25 of the world's most exceptional botanists focused on California flora um, had an expedition to the Dangerman Preserve uh, that was two half days of sampling. The results were really awe-inspiring. In two days of work, the team found nearly 300 species. They vouchered 268 species for scientific collections, and they found 39 species that had never been before documented in the Point Conception region. So this is helping fill in a black hole in our understanding of California's biodiversity, our botanical history, and evolutionary potential going forward. Sitting around the campfire that night with the botanists, it was really emotional. Many of these people have devoted their whole careers to understanding the California flora and had waited their whole lives for the opportunity to visit the Dangerman Preserve and to do some collecting. That's some indication of the enthusiasm from the research community, but it's really been much more broadly based. We have started since 2018 now 60 research projects on diverse topics from Chumash archaeology and human history to freshwater work on steelhead. And we're, this work is really being um, led in partnership with the, the finest research institutions in the world. This is giving the Nature Conservancy an opportunity to channel the enthusiasm of the scientific community about this place and shape uh, uh, focusing that, that enthusiasm on the greatest ch conservation challenges we have going forward with institutional partnerships and conservation uh, technology. So this is an opportunity to really stand at this place and have global impact. We think of the Dangerman Preserve as a platform for study where we can influence protection and management of other conservation areas, resource managers, scientists, policymakers, and educators. So if I were to leave you with um, some take homes about the Dangerman Preserve, I would say there are, there are three. It's wild, it's becoming wired, and we think it's gonna change the world. The next 10 years are critical for life on Earth. The actions we take together right now are important for protecting the natural world that we rely on and for setting us on a more hopeful, sustainable path in the future. And I think we can look to the Danger Man Preserve to provide that inspiration. In many ways, I think this was destined. In 1807, Thomas Jefferson founded the Pacific, the, the, Cal, the Coast Survey the first scientific uh, agency of the United States. And under the direction of some of the leading American scientists of the 19th century, they surveyed the coastal environments of the nation, which provided information for, uh, for economy, for national defense, and for science. In 1850, there uh, was uh, an interest in surveying the new state of California, and the Pacific Coast Survey was launched by the Coast Survey. The point of origin for that work was point conception. Flowing from that point forward was knowledge and understanding of the, of the Pacific coast and how to best navigate the future. Today we propose a similarly pioneering and foundational scientific exploration 
to use this awesome landscape for collaborations to advance conservation science, technology, and, ed and education. Never before has this been more urgent. The preserve can serve as a platform for demonstrating how conservation can rise to the challenges of a changing world through science and discovery and to inspire the next generation of conservation leaders. Thank you, and I'm going to turn it over to Liz Harvey now. Thank you so much, Mark. That was wonderful. And uh, to everybody out in our audience, it's great to see you again. I uh, had missed these webinars this last month when we've been on hiatus, and it's great to stand them up again with the places that we protect. So uh, Mark, it's wonderful always, as always, to work with you. We've worked together for 11 years now, and I, I can't think of a better person to be in charge of all the science research going on at the Dangerman Preserve. So it's fascinating to hear just these tidbits about it. And uh, I'm sure that those of you in our audience have many questions and would like to know more. So please chat them into us uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. There is a, a blank for your questions and those will be fed into us so that we can uh, ask those of Mark. So um, at this point, I'm just going to start off with uh, my own question. Uh, I, I'm really fascinated by our partnership with the Chumash, and I understand that the preserve is really important to them. And I'd love to know more about the history there, and if you could share with us how we are working with them now. Sure. Uh, maybe I'll start um, and speak to the to the research, and then turn it over to Bill for the um, for the stakeholder relations part. So we're fortunate to partner with the Smithsonian Institution on archaeological surveys and investigation of this region, which is really important for human history and for the Chumash nations. And in this work with Smithsonian, we've uh, been able to do two campaigns of field surveys of the coastal environment. This has pushed the timeline back for known occupation uh, to 8,500 years ago. Formerly, it was about 7,000 years. So this is really exciting. And I think building this strong research foundation is going to really be the key to deepening our understanding of human history at this place. And I turn it over to Bill to talk a little bit more about the relationships with the, with the Chumash nations. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, this has been an exciting year. I think that the work that Mark just described has allowed us to engage in conversations with the Chumash community that have led us to develop a really strong working relationship. And two big steps that we took this year that are really important to our moving forward um, with this relationship. One was the uh, execution of an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding between the San Inez Band of the Chumash Indians and the Nature Conservancy, which describes really um, a whole suite of, of uh, aspirational goals that we have as partners. It sets up the San Inez Band as a thought partner, not to the exclusion of other tribes. We actually want to work with all tribes in the Chumash community, but allows us to, to work with an organization that already has an established partnership with one of our important neighbors, Vandenberg Air Force Base. Uh, and um, part of the, the process of, of moving forward with this MOU will also, uh, we're also exploring the idea or the concept of actually a dedicated fellow at the Dangerman Preserve who will work with us to, um, to really bring this MOU to life, to really establish strong communications and, and thoughtful approaches to how we continue to partner in the future. So you know, the work of the, of the Smithsonian has been really, really important for us to take that step. So exciting, exciting year this way. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Mark. So we have another question from Jacob. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on recreational use on the coast. Are you going to open up the Dangerman Preserve to recreational use? Mark, you want me to start, and then I'll punt back to you on this one. I think sure. um, you know we're we're I think a lot of the what you just uh, heard from Mark is essential, critical work to establishing the significance and the importance for protecting this coast first, uh, not to the exclusion of well-managed visitation. One of our um, our goals and something we're working on and piloting now is ways that the public can come out here in a very carefully and well curated way to understand and appreciate this place and learn whether that's participating in research or as a volunteer 
or on guided uh, tours to um, the various features of this landscape. We imagine a very robust managed visitation program, um, and not to the, uh, not to the um, uh, detriment, of course, to the resources. So, Mark, you want to say more about that? Sure. Uh, I tried to highlight that um, we're learning more and more about this place, this coastline, and the sensitive conservation values, as well as the archaeological and cultural history. And that's really guiding our, our management. And I think one of the things that Bill alluded to is um, we believe that we can really engage the public through education programs and through other activities that are, that are less um, in uh, creating perhaps conflicts with the conservation values like, you know, uh, unrestricted recreational use would. So I think we're hopeful that, uh, that by deepening our understanding of how important this place is, we can manage it well and manage the right kind of public access. And Mark, uh, just to thank you, if I could just quickly add also, I think it's important that you know, we, we'd be very thoughtful about the kinds of partners that we're um, engaging in this uh, managed access approach. It's really important, for example, to uh, engage the Lompoc community where we have you know, a lot of families who are living in the poverty line and don't have opportunities to experience a place like this. So we have been in conversations with groups like the Lompoc YMCA, uh, local school district, the community college, uh, and, and and understand and appreciate how this place could be put to work to serve those communities. That's really, really heartening. And I need to just say uh, to everybody, I know we might be having some audio issues, so uh, I apologize. There's a lot of technology involved in this presentation and sometimes things don't go exactly as planned because we can't control it. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm grateful for the connections that we have. So um, this is from Eric. Uh, this place used to be a cattle ranch. Are you still maintaining the cattle operation? We are, and um, we're really excited about the ways that we've been able to adapt that to our conservation goals and objectives. So there are really uh, some, some important systems, the coastal prairie, that really need grazing uh, in order to, for the biodiversity to flourish. And there is also uh, I think an important role that grazing is uh, playing in the management of fine fuels and some of our uh, fire risk. So those are the two prongs really of this um, conservation grazing strategy. Bill, do you want to say a little more about that? Yes, thanks, Mark. So thanks to Mark, Scott Butterfield, and others uh, on our science team, we've developed a really a, a comprehensive grazing plan for the next five years to Mark's point that really looks at all these management objectives and creates a pasture rotation process that we are trying to adhere to as we balance the needs of uh, the rest of the ranch. Um, we're learning a lot about the infrastructure of the current ranch and uh, looking for ways we can adapt our water systems, our roads and fencing to meet the, meet the goals of that pasture rotation. Um, so kind of taking what Mark's describing and, and really implementing it on the ground is one of the big challenges for our staff right now. And we're learning a lot. It's our largest landscape scale management tool. Excellent. Well, I've definitely been out in the bull pasture. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty impressive. Um, and speaking of which, we have a question about um, the ice plant that we saw in the video and um, is that native? What are we planning to do with it? Um, what kind of, you know, if any restoration are we going to achieve there? No, the ice plant is not native and there's quite a bit of it as you saw on the coastal terrace there. And we have a really exciting project underway with the Coastal Conservancy and several partners to remove and restore 300 acres of ice plant. This is a massive undertaking, a, a very large piece of, of the ice plant that's there. And as we learn from that, we hope to tackle the rest of it in, in due time. Now, underneath that ice plant is important native biodiversity, as well as the key to restoring the dune systems. We have some really interesting dune systems at the nature, at the, at the preserve, but they're kind of locked up right now because of ice plant. And so we're very interested in and how they can be restored, the sand can be allowed to move again, and we can have a, a fully restored natural dune system at the preserve. 
Yeah, I think that also the Smithsonian uh, has indicated there, there's perhaps a lot of Chumash um, discoveries remaining that are locked up under that ice plant as well. Wow. Sounds complex. Uh, so we have a question from Sandra about Vandenberg and our relationship with the Air Force Base. Um, how, how are we working with them? How does it impact our work? And uh, how do we view them as a conservation partner? Well, I'll start on this one, Mark, if you don't mind. Um, so Vandenberg, as we alluded to earlier, they're our big neighbor to the north. Um, over 90,000 acres of wildlands, uh, 40 acres of additional coastline that's wild coast, most of it. Uh, and they have a strong, uh, they have a strong mandate and an interest in preserving those resources uh, and a strong interest in collaborating with the private lands around them. Uh, we think the uh, Vandenberg Air Force partnership is one of our most important partnerships in terms of achieving landscape scale conservation. Um, in addition, we've recently learned that they'll be taking over the management of the Point Conception, 30 acre Point Conception parcel from the Coast Guard. Uh, something that I know our staff has been in conversations with um, both parties about for some time, which uh, offers us another opportunity to really look at Point Conception as an important, I will call it center for connection or site for appropriate connection for both public interpretation, but also restoration and partnering with them on restoring the ice plant that you just uh, were discussing previously. Um, we are really, we're talking to Vandenberg about literally a dozen different ways we're interested in partnering uh, and really accomplishing more than we could um, separately in terms of landscape scale conservation. Mark, you wanna to add to that? Sure, uh, science is also a, a key part of our, of our um, partnership with the Air Force Base. Um, there are many threatened and endangered species occurring uh, at Vandenberg that um, have potential impacts for base operations and the evolving uh, rocketry industry of Vandenberg. And so they're very interested in a, in a partner with the skills and capacity of the Nature Conservancy to help them manage that. They also, as Bill mentioned, with 90,000 acres of, of mostly still uh, natural habitat and 40 miles of additional coastline, the opportunities for scientific discovery and collaboration are, are really immense. And we have a cooperative agreement with Vandenberg, which is sort of the point of the spear, um, focused on an endangered butterfly which um, gives us the ability to work together on that species at the Dangerman Preserve and at the Air Force Base. And we're also keenly interested in the value add that the Nature Conservancy could provide for, for data management and for regional conservation initiatives. Well, that's great to know that we have such a good relationship with them. Sounds very fruitful. Uh, we have another question uh, sort of along the same lines around uh, technology. What technology is really exciting you out on the preserve right now? Uh, what's gonna have the greatest impact from our vantage point at this point? And uh, yeah, just tell us a little bit more about that. Sure, well, we're really fortunate to have great conservation technology partners interested in the preserve and also a great conservation tech team at the Nature Conservancy. I think some of the most exciting things, some are fairly basic. You saw this as a very rugged landscape and so the ability to have wireless capability across the property from environmental sensors for our own staff is something we're working very hard on. And uh, there's some breakthroughs ahead in terms of connectivity across the preserve. I think another thing we've put a lot of energy and effort into is how do we manage data? So as I mentioned, we have these 60 or so research projects that have started. That's about five to 10 times the normal amount of any other field station. And there's, there's volumes of data. And we really believe that we can provide new ways of, of managing and synthesizing that information and turning that back out to the public and other science user groups um, through uh, developing a web portal, a data portal, um, which Kelly Easterday has done through our colleagues at, at the National Center for Ecology at UC Santa Barbara. And so we're hooked to some of the most important biodiversity data networks in the world right now. And that's giving us a real leg up on how we manage data and how we um, put it to use for conservation. Wow. Really yeah, from, uh, from a, I, yeah, just, I, I can't add much more to that. I just say from a, somebody who, who's got it selfishly on the ground here, I'm very excited. We've made some great strides in the last few weeks in upgrading our on-preserve communications infrastructure, thanks to our tech team. 
uh, which will greatly increase our on-preserve communications capabilities, which is really important from a safety uh, visitation standpoint, as well as connectivity, as Mark's describing with our, our wider partner community. Excellent. So we have another one. Uh, what is the most unexpected species discovery so far? I think this is for you, Mark. <laughs> well, there have been several. Um, one, I, I think, is an additional garter snake found on the property uh, by, by um, Brad Schaefer and his team from UCLA that we hadn't really expected. Brad's one of the world experts on garter snakes, and so this is a, is a great addition. And the Point Conception area and this whole region of California are one of the evolutionary hotspots for our, our reptile and amphibian communities. So that was exciting. I think we've also um, been excited to find tricolored blackbirds on the property, uh, which was unexpected. And so we have a nice colony of tricolors, which are uh, a threatened California species. They look very similar to red winged blackbirds. You got to look pretty close to figure them out. Um, it's just every time uh, an expert visits, we find something new. So I don't know whether I could pick just one or two. It's just. Uh, you know, the place is just magic for scientific discovery. Awesome. So uh, we have Leonardi uh, is asking, how are the abalone populations at danger? Well, abalone as elsewhere on the coast are not doing very well from uh, the same things that I mentioned relative to the sea star disease and changing ocean conditions. I think they're one of the species that um, has the most potential for a bounce back in this region though. And we're excited to be working with some of the abalone experts on how that might happen at a place like this where we have marine protection, terrestrial protection, and really good, good habitat waiting for uh, them to come back. Uh, and then we have another question. And by the way, thank you so much for all these questions. What plans exist for time series studies of past fires and future research and management of fire? I think fire is on all of our minds. Yeah, yeah fire is certainly a continuing uh, topic for us as Californians and at the Dangerman Preserve as well. Um, we've reached out to some of the um, best fire experts in the state uh, working with UC Cooperative Extension and we've put together, to the best of our abilities, a fire history for the preserve going back to the early ranching days. So we're getting a better understanding of what has happened here in terms of natural and prescribed fire um, over, over the years. And we're also doing some fire behavior modeling with this team that I'll be excited to report on when we get some results in. But we're, we're very interested in how we can learn from that fire history. And of course, fire was really a, a, a important part of the, um, the Chumash uh, management of, of these lands, um, burning for game and for geophytes. So there's an important uh, human management uh, historical angle where we want to understand too. Yeah, and I would add, um, uh, so from a standpoint of kind of health and human safety and, and, and being good community partners, our staff has been meeting with um, groups in the greater Santa Barbara area uh, that are interested in wildfire protection and uh, the Santa Barbara Fire and others are, are very interested in partnering with the Interim Preserve on thinking about you know, our interest in managing fire for ecological purposes and how that could fit into or feather into a larger plan for community safety and wildfire protection. So yet another, and that could extend into our communications technology. We have recently installed uh, fire cameras, which has uh, really been a huge, huge boost out here on a couple of sites on the preserve, thanks to our tech team. And um, so we're, we're increasingly finding ways that we can be uh, a, a strong partner in the community around this whole issue of fire and fire safety as well. Thank you, thank you, Mark and Bill. Okay, um, so we have another one from Jim Ford. Do you conjecture that the seal population on the coast was very large when the grizzly resided here? Uh, that's a great question uh, uh, about grizzlies. You know, we do have this uh, interesting uh, uh, complex of predators at the preserve with, uh, with the seals, the sharks, and the um, mountain lions. Um, I think the mountain lions probably mimic in some ways uh, uh, having uh, predators like grizzly bear in the mix too. Um, that, that's something I think we'd have to investigate with uh, 
with some of our bear experts to get some sense about what it was really like on the coast. Um, grizzly bears ate a lot of different things. I'm not sure that they were really after the seals. I, I, re I recall being on Vancouver Island uh, on the long beach of Vancouver Island and seeing wolf tracks there. And uh, I was on a run, so it made me run a little faster. So I imagine if I go on a run on that beach, I'm gonna run fast too. Um, <laughs> what plans exist for, oh, so we've, sorry, we've done this one, okay, from Sue. Are there any near-term opportunities for volunteering, uh, community service, or anything within COVID precautions? or potentially outside of COVID also? Well, I'll, I'll start on this one. So, I, you know, we are in the process of um, carefully and thoughtfully opening the preserve for the kinds of activities that, uh, including obviously research, which Mark just described, that we deem as sort of essential to moving our vision forward, but doing it in a way that, that people are safe uh, and we're taking every precaution. Uh, interestingly, one of the one of the opportunities I think for folks to visit and do it in a safe way will likely be in in a volunteer capacity. So, um, uh, Mark, uh, myself, and our staff, uh, our visitation staff, and others are really looking at opportunities to do that. And I know historically, before COVID, uh, one of the ways folks have been able to engage out here is doing restoration with uh, one of my colleagues, Laura Riga, on oaks uh, oak planting. Um, I imagine with the massive ice plant challenge we have out here, we're going to have significant volunteer opportunities for ice plant removal um, and a number of other things. And Mark may want to jump in here. So stay tuned, I guess, is my, my main point. Stay tuned. Yeah, indeed. We're, we're very interested also in the citizen science or community science opportunities. Uh, you know, this is a big landscape to cover and having more eyes on the biodiversity is uh, proving to be in, in many, many other places. And community science is, uh, is providing a lot of dividends from getting people involved in projects and helping us do work at, at big scale. So one of the things we're, um, we're gonna do with our own staff is a coastal survey day in conjunction with the California Academy of Sciences in November. And that'll give us a chance to kind of dry run the kind of mobile apps that um, would be used in this sort of community science and hopefully we can use that to develop some volunteer opportunities as well. Well, we look forward to those and we look forward to welcoming people in and volunteering to serve for sure. Okay, uh, I'm going to project, I've been um, getting some feedback that my voice is not carrying very well. So if it seems like I'm yelling, I'm just trying to project. <laughs> um, we have another question from Jeffrey. If a wildfire were to op be offered on the preserve, would it be extinguished or allowed to burn? Shall, shall I take that? Sure. <laughs> yeah, well today, if it happened today, we would be trying to extinguish it very quickly. Um, we have uh, a lot of folks would be in harm's way. I think Mark can speak to our kind of our long-term plans about how we want to manage fire out here. but. As I alluded to in my previous answer, um, we're full partners with the county on on preventing a major conflagration from erupting here. Um, we had a little bit of a scare last week uh, with an adjacent property where one of the lightning strikes hit, and our response, uh, our fire department, uh, local fire department response was was fast, and uh, they were on it pretty quickly. So um, you know we're right now at safety first. Um, and uh, until we get clear about what, how we want to um, manage fire in the future, maybe Mark wants to add there. Yeah, I think community safety is priority number one. I think there's also opportunity for us to develop uh, fire management techniques, including prescribed fire that can help us understand how to better manage these communities and, re and uh, natural communities and reduce the threat of catastrophic wildfire. So I think, I think all of that, but definitely uh, community safety is the first priority. That's really uh, good to know. And yeah, it's such a tough issue because it's something that you really can't plan for. Um, it, you never know when it's gonna happen. And we've been lucky, I think, at the preserve that we've avoided some of the really bad fires that have struck Santa Barbara in recent years. 
Um, okay, so back to ice plant. Kitty is asking, how did the ice plant get there? Uh, the ice plant experts are not in agreement about this. Um, ice plant is native to South Africa, and there is a school of thought that it came um, with the with the Spanish, um, as uh, as many things did um, in the form of seed uh, that was established as uh, as they brought livestock to California. Um, there also is um, a. a, a a sense that maybe ice plant um, has naturally gotten to some parts of the New World, probably not California. And then there's also that ice plant is used heavily um, in dune stabilization projects for roadways and for the railroad. And so there are multiple ideas about how, um, how it got here. Um, regardless, it, it has done a very good job at competing against native vegetation and has overtaken a lot of areas of the California coast. And um, it can be a real problem for biodiversity. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we also have another question about uh, wildlife. So have elk ever been there? Um, and could they take the place of cows? Um, there are uh, elk were along the California coast um, in uh, probably going back to the to the 1800s. And so um, elk uh, have been uh, in this environment uh, historically. Um, they could be restored to a place like this, um, but they'd have to be in such numbers as to really mimic uh, the grazing benefit that we get for our conservation targets um, from cows. And there are some places that we can look to for examples of how this has been done, uh, notably Point Reyes and other places where elk have been reestablished and the ecosystem management effects of having elk have been studied. Um, okay, so let's see, Todd is asking, what is the status of its in, in invasive exotics and what are plans to deal with them? Yes, um, the preserve, although it's, it has in largely intact ecosystems, also has invasive plants and animals. And so we have a number of planning efforts underway to better understand our uh, invasives and to um, uh, develop some management prescriptions. Uh, one of the first, first things we're focused on is um, feral pigs, which can be a real problem for our beaches and other high biodiversity areas. So we're um, doing a, a bit of work right now with UC Santa Barbara on pig management and developing a pig management plan. Um, invasive plants are sort of next up in the planning in the planning queue. Um, I've already talked quite a bit about the ice plant, which is really our most extensive invasive plant issue, but there are others and we're hoping to get on them uh, before they become a significant problem because with invasive plants, uh, it's really important to treat them before they get established. Thank you. Okay, and what about constructing a lab on the preserve? What are our plans to do that? Bill, you want to take that? Uh, sure, and you can fill in. So um, one of the things, our first priority has been to really get our hands around the historic ranch infrastructure here, the ranch houses, the barns, corrals, et cetera, and really figuring out how we can repurpose those and repair them so that we have sort of minimum viable uh, 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 places to work and to visit and stay for staff and researchers. Uh, one of the uh, next steps and one of the high priorities in the next year or two for our strategic plan is to begin to develop a long-term vision for how do we create a world-class research field station experience here at this place on the coast. We're in the coastal zone, so we're, we're governed and ruled by the Coastal Development Act. And uh, so we have to be very thoughtful. And one of the things actually to the I think an earlier question about partnerships, we've been working with uh, Cal Poly Pomona's Environmental Landscape Design School and their faculty on developing some concepts around you know, how folks will interact with this place, both at the existing facilities, but even looking at other visitor serving infrastructure, whether that's pathways and signs and gathering areas. And um, we've been working on a place to recognize um, 
uh, donors to our world campaign. So really thinking of ways that we can bring visitation to the preserve, but also respect um, the conservation goals and objectives. And to that end, Mark's been working with UC Bren School on a tool that will help uh, inform how people will interface out here. And maybe he wants to say a little bit about that as well as field station. Sure, I'll talk a little bit about the, the tool first. We did a project with the Bren School uh, last year on how to balance the various uses and program, programs at the preserve with protecting the conservation values. And it's a, really a, kind of a spatial optimization tool that helps us look at the activities that are proposed and the potential impacts they could have on the conservation values we're trying to protect and help us make decisions about trade-offs and obviously um, citing and uh, focusing frequency, duration, and impact in places that have the least environmental harm is in our interest. Um, regarding facilities and, and field station, um, field stations uh, the world over are most productive when there are adequate facilities for research. I think we're fortunate that we're, we're really starting from the very beginning here. And as Bill mentioned, the opportunity to, to repurpose um, the ranch infrastructure and fix things up so that they can be used uh, in multiple purposes, including research, is sort of phase one. I think we're also very active in our conversations with our research community about what their needs are so that we can um, really build to design regarding the um, conservation and, and science initiatives that we're developing right now. Excellent. Well, that's really exciting to hear about. Uh, we have another question around partnerships, and I know you've mentioned so many already, um, but we're someone's asking specifically about UCLA's involvement, um, uh, UC Santa Cruz, and any other universities we're working with. Sure. Well, as you heard, we have a, a very active engagement in our, our work on the coast with uh, UC Santa Barbara and UC Santa Cruz, Cal Poly on botany. Um, we're also working with a number of other um, institutions, Smithsonian, um, UC Berkeley, UCLA. Uh, we've mostly worked um, with Brad Schaefer on a few projects. Uh, Brad is at the Institute of, of the Environment at UCLA and is a leading uh, herpetologist. Um, so I think in this moment, we're really interested in um, folks that can help us with understanding the baseline conditions of the conservation values and also can help us take uh, a really um, intentional um, approach to the leading conservation questions in the world right now. And so whether that's um, this institution or that institution is really going to depend on their level of expertise regarding the questions that we most need to answer. That's great. Well, we have so many great institutions here in California and in other states. So, um, and I'm sure around the world, this will just grow. So it's very exciting. If I could just say one more thing about that, I think that it's, um, you know, our academic partners are, are sort of our go-to for science, but we're really fortunate to have great partnerships that have emerged in technology with Esri, with Microsoft, with other folks. And so I think that the opportunity to bring maybe non-traditional partnerships together that involve a, a spectrum of expertise is, is what's really exciting to us. Yeah, another, another one of those would be in education. Um, you know, we've mentioned briefly earlier our, our pilots, but a Nature Bridge is a partner we've been working with on helping figure out how we want to design environmental education out here. And now with the curveball of COVID, how we do that in a social distance and appropriate way. Um, we've also had conversations with uh, UC Bren about how we could partner with them on really establishing a, a kind of a cohort pathway with Dangerman serving as a, a pathway for leadership development around a, a whole diversity of conservation and stewardship and uh, landscape uh, kinds of um, um, learnings and, and then feed that into and, and provide a pathway into higher education uh, for various people uh, with that. So. Well, I think with that, we're a little bit over time. Um, I know that Esri is an incredibly important uh, technology partner with us, and they will continue to be uh, throughout the lifetime of the preserve. Uh, so we thank them, and uh, we thank all of you for being with us. Uh, we will have a survey sent out right after this, so we would really appreciate your uh, filling it out, 
letting us know how you enjoyed today's presentation. And also please let us know what you'd like to see in the future. And if there's any specific preserve you'd like to visit virtually, please let us know. Uh, we are also looking forward to, speaking of the next preserve, uh, looking forward to next week's presentation, which is on, oh, I'm sorry, on the, the 30th, when we explore Santa Cruz Island. Um, we're going to go to uh, this really important place across the channel. Uh, so I hope that you will travel with all of us to visit Santa Cruz Island and see what we've done there and what we're planning to do. And with that, uh, I think we are going to see a really special video. And I just want to say thank you again for choosing to spend your time with TNC on this webinar. And thank you so much for supporting our organization and our critical mission. Bye bye.